listening to Afternoon Drive with Joanne Joseph. Live, online, smartphones, DSTV, and 92.7 and 106 FM. 12 minutes past five. Welcome to the final hour of Afternoon Drive here on 702 for the Curious. Lovely to have you with us if you've just tuned in. Lots of responses to uh, that interview we did just a short while ago. Introducing Rebecca Davis, first of all, who appealed to the women of the EFF to come out and say what they thought about what they had seen unfolding with regard to the Karima Brown controversy over the last few days. The fact that Julius Malema had posted her number on social media and a lot of people responded violently, threatening her. Uh, And, of course... What a week it's been from a gender point of view. It started with Babes Wodumo's uh, social media video of what looks to be her assault at the hands of her partner and producer, Mampincha. She ended up laying assault charges. He said he was going to lay counter charges against her. Uh, Then this Julius Malema thing happened. Uh, He shared Karima Brown's number on Twitter and she was threatened with rape and other violent crimes as a result. So that led us to the question of what makes men feel so entitled to the bodies of women in some cases or to threaten violence, particularly of a sexual nature against women. In this hour, we've, we've decided to simply dedicate our conversation to that topic. And we've invited into studio Lisa Vetten, WITS researcher, gender activist and founding member of Men's Forum, Mbuyesela Bu- uh, Buerta, and Luke Lamprecht, a child safety specialist for women and men against child abuse. Really lovely to have all three of you in studio with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming in. Lisa, I'm actually going to start with you. I mean, it's so easy to become disillusioned with one incident after another, you you begin to believe there is a massive upsurge in in this kind of gender violence. Is that the case or are are just more of these cases starting to come to light because we've become a society that started to talk about these problems? I think it's more a case of the latter. Our statistics are appallingly bad. You really can't take them at face value. They're either 20 years old or 10 years old. Those are a better quality. And those that are more recent have so many question marks on them that it's hard to know whether we're dealing with an increase or a decrease. My sense is we're dealing with a very stagnant situation, that very little has changed over the last two, three decades. So I think what we're seeing is a greater willingness to speak and perhaps to get angry. But I think we have also seen some changes. I think where we were in the 1990s, when marital rape was not even a crime, and there was no kind of legal protection if you were being abused by your partner, there was no court order, then yes, the gains might be small, but nonetheless they've been there. But we've had systems that have been in place for centuries. They're not going to disappear over 40 or 50 years. So, so Mbuselo, let's bring you into the conversation. I mean, Elisa acknowledging here that the situation is perhaps slightly uh, getting slightly better or there's an awareness, uh, uh, shall we say, from the public about what is going on, more of a willingness to talk about these issues. Does that necessarily mean there's going to be a change in the way South African men behave towards women? Well, thank you for having us. I think, John, the, the change is going to be gradual. Uh, the change is happening. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, we... To use the usual, you know, it's like it's not yet Uhuru. We, we must continue engaging men and boys uh, because it's going to be a long haul. I mean, all of us must be ready to to really acknowledge that. I mean, we, uh, we have a long way to go, but you're seeing some gains in terms of awareness but, uh, because, uh, what, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have the, the outrage that you have in today uh, with, I mean, uh, violence against women and against men, against children. You wouldn't have this, but... I, I think that, and probably I am being naive or I'm being an eternal optimist, but I think that having have done or continue doing this work for many, many years, I think there are visible changes that one sees. I mean, uh, what, what interested me this time around yeah. was, was how many men who spoke up, and, and perhaps that's uh, just from my point of view, engaging with particular men on, on 702, but a lot of men were really outraged, whereas in the past, uh, it was mostly the voices of women we were hearing in that regard. That's exactly what I mean, because uh, you, we, 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 we tend to be too hard on ourselves, and rightly so, and justifiably so, more often than not. But I, I think we must also... These are small gains that, you, look, uh, John, it, it has never been, uh, you know, it has never fashionable, if you like. But, but now you, you're seeing a lot of men saying that, look, this will not happen in, in, in my name. But, but sadly that when you see these pockets of violence, and, and all of us must condemn them, you, we tend to, you know, be, be, be as if it's doom and gloom. But I, I am of the view that there's a lot that is happening which is positive. 
You've spoken about the issue of men and boys and, and what needs to happen in that regard. And Luke Lamprecht, you have been working very extensively in this field. You spend quite a lot of your time working specifically with boys, uh, working with boys who've offended in the past uh, violently, uh, trying to, to uh, so, we say, so we say, change their fortunes uh, so that they are able to, to be rehabilitated and to enter, reintegrate into society in a way that they can be gentle men uh, in the true sense of that word. How is that going? What are you finding when, when you engage with these boys? Well, I think there's been two very interesting developments over sort of my 30-year career. Is that there have been a lot of um, programs focused at the girl child. So it's sort of bring the girl child to work and girl children uh, need to be given and empowered and given skills and so on. And they've kind of left the boy child behind. Because there's almost this um, this perception that even if boys are abused, you go from being an abuser, uh, an abused child, you go to being an abuser. There's no space for being a victim within the in the realm of men. So it's kind of if you've been sexually abused as a child, you become an abuser. And the difficulty with that is that we don't allow uh, our young men kind of a richness of emotional vocabulary and emotional experiences that allow them to process some of the adverse childhood experiences they have. And the result of that often is that they act out. And the, the it's, it's almost like they're acting out this internal kind of pain and inflicting it on other people. And that's really what I get from, from these young men. So the ability to be vulnerable in, the, in light of kind of current masculinity is, is almost a fragility. And that fragility seems to shatter men quite easily. I mean, this whole conversation about toxic masculinity and the Gillette advert, which I absolutely thought was like a, a wonderful talking piece. So and did the people I. Were, people <laughs> were flushing, yeah, the, uh, flushing their uh, kind of razors down the toilet. And the, the rise of these men's rights associations where men are these victims and is, is starting to this pushback of this kind of really toxic masculinity is, is again raising its head because men are saying, well, you're saying... It's all us, you know, the hashtag men are trash. So I think the conversations have have become very sort of binary. And, and and perhaps that that doesn't allow for the nuances which which this these kinds of situations and this this conversation around violence requires really Lisa I mean when Luke talks of binary statements mm. I think of, of of many people this week saying to us if a woman is beaten why doesn't she just walk out it's mm. fairly easy but but it's not is it why is walking out so complex Lisa you know, I think I want to go back a little bit, Joanne, and think and just say that we need to be quite careful about outrage. Just because people get get upset doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting upset in a particularly progressive or transformative way. And I think, you know, actually, outrage around violence against women is very old. I've been doing my PhD, which is a history of rape, and you can find outrage being expressed around rape dating back to the 1870s. So it's not new. And I hear quite often in a lot of this outrage what I'm going to call protectionism. Men, be real men. Stand up. Be proper men. Protect women. That is very, very old-fashioned conservative language that doesn't change much. So it, I've almost seen it being playing out here now with Babes Duman. I'm going to use the EFF. Yes. On to, off they go and they lay charges. How outrageous. I think it's quite easy in some ways to feel sorry for Babes Duma because she's such an unambiguous victim. She's done nothing to provoke it. It's quite clear he just walked, his use of violence is just casual. He's comfortable with it. So it's very clear that she cannot be blamed in any way. So there's a great deal of sympathy for her. And off you have with this EFF individual, like wanting to be her knight in shining armor, rushing off to go and be her champion and lay charges at the police station. The following day, you have the leader of the EFF posting a woman's telephone number and having people issue threats against her, and there's nothing there. That, to me, captures, in a nutshell, the problem we have. As long as she's a good, pure victim, we're all on her side. The minute it starts to muddy and bring in other complexities, like this woman might be criticizing our political leader, suddenly it becomes so much more ambiguous, and suddenly the desire to be a knight in shining armor disappears. So I think the EFF, for me, this whole debacle illustrates precisely why we're not making any progress. Because as long as she's a particular kind of victim, we will all stand up and be outraged. Other women, sorry for you. And some of those other women are, are the women who do stay in relationships. Uh, Joan, I mean, the, the fact that, that Elisa is I mean, bringing in the political um, I mean, EFF. Yes. But, but in the mix, you then have Musi Maimani. 
Yes, yes. another example. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 uh, Musi Maiman is saying when you, when you talk about a, a toxic, toxic masculinity, that yes. look, here's a ring. Yes. You know, come, come here. Boxing ring. And yes, then, because the then, then, Jones, what we do is you are normalizing. Uh, Musi is saying that it's okay. You know, it's the same as saying, look, uh, when, when you have rape, you must be raped. You know, and, and, and this is how, uh, how the majority of us throughout the world, uh, that look, you, we, we've always been raised to believe that, look, boys will always be boys. Uh, where you, you normalize, where you institutionalize violence. Yes. And he, he's saying that, look, I, I, I want him to, you know, uh, t- I want to take him on. Uh, let's have, you know, someone with his yeah. physics and what. And that for me, is, it's, it's not only problematic because it sends a, a very, a message that says, look, it's okay to be violent because yes. that's how men behave. Yes, and, and we solve problems with and, violence. And, and, and there, there will be sectors that don't see anything wrong with what Musi has said. But I think that in the same way that all forms of violence must be condemned. It's also a very old-fashioned response. You're not a proper man. Come, you're a coward. What sort of man hits women? Come, let us be two men and sort it out amongst each other. So it's again that reflection of that very old-fashioned chivalrous masculinity, which is not transformative. So yes, we've got Musi expressing his outrage, but it doesn't change gender stereotypes and the status quo. So I think it's not enough to be upset. You've got to look at the content of what people's outrage is and, and, and think, is that transformative or is it merely expressing a deeply patriarchal status quo that is where we ask for men to be kindly a better patriarchs we don't actually try to move towards something that is much more egalitarian uh, look at this is such an interesting aspect of the conversation because <coughs> some people may argue that that the men who've just been mentioned are all products of a deeply patriarchal society who, who cannot see themselves solving problems in any other way other than by by, by using violence of one kind or another Absolutely. And I think what we have done is we have created in in our patriarchal structures, we have created emotionally disabled adult men. And those emotionally disabled adult men raise other emotionally disabled adult men. I mean, if you look as a simple thing at the sort of the boys school culture where privilege is accessed and where you where children are educated into being these wonderful men on the one hand you've got them shaking your hand morning sir nodding then you listen to them um standing around the braai with the beer and the way they talk about women is so deeply offensive i I, I can't even listen to it Mm -hmm. so the splitting in the male psyche between this this need to kind of present this kind of uh, almost snakes in suits kind of persona where I, I do all the right things, all the social airs and graces, but internally I can't access myself. And because of my inability to access myself, accessing another person in an empathetic way is actually impossible because the drive to provide and protect the polemic that Lisa was talking about that this is the role of a man and a good man provides and protects, has not allowed us to be nurturers, it's not allowed us to be carers. I can be in a training conference of 200 people, I'm the only man. And there's something very odd for me about the fact that men don't want to engage in spaces that make them vulnerable and make them need to care because the masculinity is so fragile that anything that gets kind of flicked against it, like the Gillette advert, kind of makes it crumble and throw their hands in the air and say, you know, we need to go back to old school, you know, where where men were men because men commit more suicide, they spend more time in jail, et cetera, et cetera, the Men's Rights Association arguments. And those arguments are based on the fact that we have raised men that can't access their emotions, which is why they end up killing themselves more and end up in jail more because of their violence. I mean, they they create a circular self-sealing argument that keep men trapped in this in the space of kind of almost an emotion emotionless state of kind of um, yeah, emotional paralysis really. Yes, yes. Uh, this is uh, what you're hearing right now, a conversation that uh, has been brought to us by Lead Essay. We're very fortunate to have in studio Luke Lamprecht, Mbuise Lebota and uh, Lisa Vetten, experts uh, in this field, uh, people who are working with uh, this kind of reality on a daily basis. And remember, we're also broadcasting live on Facebook. So if you'd like to have a look at our guests and uh, observe our conversation from a visual point of view, you, you're more than welcome to uh, join us there. For the curious on 92.7 and 106 FM.
just after a quarter to six on the program. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you have, uh, you've tuned in at the right time because we've invited into studio Lisa, Lisa Vetton. She's a gender researcher, busy with her PhD at the moment into the issue of rape. Uh, gender activist and founding member of Men's Forum, Mbuisela Buerta, joins us. And Luke Lumprecht, child safety specialist for women and men against child abuse. And uh, of course, this uh, discussion is brought to you by Lead SA. And uh, watch us live on Facebook if you'd like to see uh, what our situation is like right now in studio. Lovely to have my three guests with me, all experts in their field. So, Lisa, I want to start this uh, segment off with you. Uh, and and this is a question about women who report violence, mm. because we, we've been getting a lot of feedback from our listeners on that, saying these women do not get the support they deserve. Until that happens, how much progress can we actually count on in solving gender violence? You know, the problem with reporting is that it's very much a lottery. So we hear about when it goes badly, but we don't hear when it goes well. And there are occasions when it does go well, or as, as best as it can be, in considering that it's a very difficult experience to talk about. Yes. And I think it would be useful to start to focus on how it is that some police stations can get it right and others can't. Because quite clearly some of the excuses we've heard about lack of resources, we don't have enough training, blah, 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 are not universally true. So I think it would be useful for us to start trying to understand where are things working and what can we learn from that. But because there certainly needs to be a lot of work that still gets put into the um, improving the police response and the court response in order to make more women come forward, if that's possible. I think the other area we need to be looking at is in the realm of services. You know, we've talked a lot about, oh, we heard the president speaking about the need for Tudor care centres in terms of post-rape care. We're going to be having more shelters. But if you go and look at the Department of Social Development's budget, the program that gets the second least amount of funding nationally is the Victim Empowerment Program. Mm. So there you can see a real deprioritization. I think this is an issue where you can stand up and make wonderful, fine-sounding phrases and rhetoric, but the money, the amount you put into it, is really the true test. And when you can see in many of our services, our post-rape care and our shelters, that the Department of Social Development provides subsidies that are below even the, minimum, the national minimum wage, that tells you about the value placed on that work. And if, you, if in 2016 you see for the first time the Department of Social Development trying to work out how many shelters we need in the country, and you can see from their analysis that Gauteng, which probably has the most, is still only at 12% of the assessment, you can see how much this has been neglected. So what I think we're missing is some kind of rational approach to the problem, where we sit down and say, this is, this is the extent of it. This is the kind of training we need. Mm. These are the kinds of services. This is what it's going to cost. Where do we have services? Where do we not have services? And until that starts to happen, we're going to continue to have a lottery. We're going to have people abdicating responsibility. We're going to have fine phrases, but paper promises rather than anything meaningful. Look, you know, it's interesting what Lisa is saying. I mean, all of the, the government sh departments uh, she speaks about uh, are, are failing to provide the kind of support that uh, survivors require. Uh, and yet I want to bring it back to the notion of a patriarchal society. Mm. We talk about this. We acknowledge it all the time that whatever mm. culture we are from in this country, they're all of a patriarchal nature, whether we like it or not. 100%. I mean, if, if that is governing, the root thought, the root setting up of these departments, the, the, the root paradigm to approaching abuse in the country, how do we get beyond that cultural bias towards masculinities, towards patriarchy, versus trying to find a balance that empowers women? So I think that, I think there's two two primary things that that I'm trying to look at at the moment. The idea that if men give up some of patriarchy, they lose something. Rather than saying what of the systems in place can we retain while losing the ones that facilitate abusive behavior. So I think, again, what people are doing is they're saying because men are in positions of power, they're wielded in a certain kind of way. And the split is that if I give some of that up, there's nothing left to replace it. You're trying to take my manliness away from me, which is what the men's rights associations essentially are saying. So for me, the conversation is not necessarily, I mean, I always say that women who aspire to be like men lack ambition, you know, so. It's the, true to that, I think. <laughs> so, but uh, the, point, uh, the point that I make through the joke is the fact that it's, it's trying to move to a new way of thinking. And it's a sharing of the way of being in the world that we, we can both share in ways that no one needs to dominate. And it's not about the loss of something because men feel they're going to lose something. And when we talk about empowering women, 
men get all upset because what are you doing for me? And they go into this kind of victim mode. Because I think the, the, the kind of the pillars on which patriarchy is built are so really fragile that it relates to power, which is really related to the ability to provide, which uh, uh, sort of asserts control over those less kind of less powerful than them, which are women and children. Rather than saying, we can all share in this, and by me changing the way I think, I'm not losing something. In fact, I'm gaining a richness of relational experience that I currently do not have. Uh, and we say, look, can we, can we take this back into the home for a moment? Because I want to discuss the domestic situation. Mm. Uh, many cultural traditions in this country dictate uh, that gender violence is resolved within families. So, so uh, in the absence of a woman who's being abused, you might have family members, particularly male family members, uh, who will come together and speak about that situation of abuse. Mm. Uh, the police will not be involved in it. It will go through several processes within that family uh, until it's exhausted. But by that time, the woman woman could be severely injured, she could even be dead. How, how do we get out of that sort of paradigm where, where we choose to, to explore these problems simply within our inner family circles without saying there's actually a law in the country that governs this? I think, John, we, 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 need, we, we can get out of that by, in fact, a, I mean, family members putting themselves into the shoes of women who are raped, who are violated, that, that it can be a private matter, it can be a domestic, it's a societal thing. So that, John, we get to a point where we don't ask what I consider inappropriate questions uh, that you see. I mean, the recent example that, why, is, why are you taking so long? Why now? Uh, as if there's some nefarious agenda. So, so and, 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 and families, families are, in fact, more often than not to be blamed because then you, you're creating this environment where women would not come out because for fear of being shamed or being stigmatized or being blamed. So I, I think it's going to be important. And I go back to my pet subject. Uh, until we uh, engage men, mobilize, galvanize them and say, but look, they, they have to be allies in ensuring that women are able to speak out and seek help without f fear of being stigmatized or being uh, vilified. You know, each of you is an expert in your field, and, and we're, we're slowly coming to, to the end of our conversation. So I want to ask you, in, in whatever area in which you specialize, if you had to give the government advice or, or women, ordinary people advice, anyone listening to you right now, men who are perhaps battling with their own violence at the moment, uh, young men who, who don't know which way to turn because they're not getting any proper advice or guidance on this, what would each of you suggest is the right way to proceed in order to eradicate this ill from us? Society. Can I start with you, Lisa? Goodness. <laughs> it's a very yes. broad question, I understand. I have the solution. <laughs> it's no problem. <laughs> no, I don't. You know, I think I recently came across a very useful phrase, which I want to repeat here, and that's a wicked problem. Wicked problems are those sorts of problems that have multiple causes, which you have to attack from multiple angles in order to do anything about them. And they're often deeply entrenched. So I think violence against women is a wicked problem. There are many, many things that contribute to it, and there are no magic silver bullets that are going to fix it overnight. So that might sound pessimistic, but I think it's useful for people to bear in mind because when things don't change, they give up. And sometimes you have to have a long historical view of 100 years to see actually they do change, but perhaps just not in the way that we want. So don't give up because things haven't changed overnight. Let's persist. And I think there'd be a range of things that we can do to improve things. The first would be, I think, to do some rational planning around what are the kinds of services we need. People often dismiss that on the basis of, oh, that's reactive, it's after the problem. No, it isn't. You know, especially when you're talking about children. Children who have observed violence are have difficulties in life. Whether or not they grow up to become abusers or victims, they, they have other sorts of difficulties. So investing in programs that also address children's needs would be really important. So I think sitting and thinking what would be the kinds of range of services that we require, what would they cost, how do you put them in place would be one, one, another one very practical place to start. I think another thing is for people to bear in mind that gender is relational. You men don't make sense unless you have their opposite women. So we would actually have to sit and think, much as you want to change men, what does that mean for femininity and how we think about it and how that's constructed? Yes. So it has to be a conversation between both men and women. And I think it is important to bear in mind that women are not the same. They do want different things. And yes. some women are going to want are quite happy with the way things are, others are not. So I think it's a conversation which both men and women do have to have. And I think it's also 
if we look at some of the interesting conversations we've started happening around people who are transgender, what what are we working towards? The movement away from gender completely, or as I think people who are transgender have have made quite clear some people do feel there are very definitely a gender and want to keep mass male or female in place yes. so i think we've also got to think about where is it that we're going because we often talk about what we don't want but it's not really about well what is this new kind of world that we are envisioning how would it be different how do we accommodate the fact that gender exists on a spectrum that some people would like to maintain a binary Others wouldn't. They'd like something different. So how do we have those conversations about where it is that we're actually going that involve everybody? Because it's a system. All of us have grown up in it. You can't have a conversation around it with just one segment of the population. It has to be with everybody because these things run deep. It's quite easy for women to get conflicted and themselves to buy into particular patriarchal notions themselves because you can make it work for you. Yes, yes. Some lovely thoughts there, Lisa. Mm. Luke, what are your thoughts on this? So... You know, for me, the the ability to care for another person is what causes you to not hurt them. So the ability to see another person as a person in a relational way and to care about the effect that their behavior has on you is empathy. And in order for us to be empathic, we first have to be mindful, we have to be present. We have to be able to think about another person in a way that doesn't just meet our needs. And then we truly have to be able to act in a way that we do not want to harm that other person. And all of that occurs through how we are raised. It's the very simple thing of was was I planned, was I wanted? Because if I was planned and wanted as a child, I will be loved. And if I am loved and I have parents who love me unconditionally and the paternal function who, you know, wait till your dad gets home kind of thing, you know, you have a, you have a world that makes sense and it's safe. That is a world where you are not being harmed and you don't have adverse childhood experiences. And as a result, you are unlikely to commit those adverse experiences on others. So for me, it begins with a very basic thing. We actually need to go back to basics and conceive our children in mind before we put them in the world and raise what in many instances are quite, quite monstrous people who do quite monstrous things. Wow, that, that really does bring it home to you. Buisela, I'm going to give you the last well, thing. Well, I, I think that, they, they, I mean, the total shutdown, the summit that happened, I think the, the president, um, I mean, has started a process that uh, we need to, I mean, the, it has to be, he has to walk that talk. It's important that we go back. But, but finally, Jones, I think for me is that there, there has to be resources into working with men and boys as allies towards stopping gender-based violence, but also to encourage men who are who are who are hurting because you know that when you hurt, you likelihood is that they're going to hurt others. That seeking help is going to be important for, for men in, in in fact in liberating themselves because patriarchy on its own, I mean I have never seen I, I, I always characterize it as a bigger prison that imprisons all of us, men in particular. Beautiful thoughts, and thank you so much for sharing them with us. Uh, this discussion brought to you by Lead SA, and I hope you've managed to uh, stream it live on Facebook. I'd like to thank very, very much Lisa Vetten, uh, Witz Gender Researcher, Gender Activist, and Founding Member of Men's Forum, Buiselo Buerta, and Luke Lamprecht, Child Safety Specialist for Women and Men Against Child Abuse. Of course, I could keep talking to you for hours because this is such an important <laughs> topic, but hopefully we'll have you back in studio at some point to continue the discussion. It's an important one to have. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thanks and thank you for listening at home or in your car. It's been fantastic being with you this evening. Let's do it all again tomorrow.